Hello, I'm George Dennison, a broadcaster at 4Player Network, and these are my top 10 games of 2015. Her story is surprisingly compelling considering it's effectively a database of videos and a search engine. What I really like about this murder mystery is that it's a great example of non-linear interactive storytelling. Similar to Gone Home, you have to piece together a jumbled plot and the way you can happen upon crazy twists among the sea of interrogation videos you're searching through feels very organic. The game has some great stylistic touches as well, like the eerie reflections in the screen and the mood setting music, and I like how the old fashioned technology you're working with creates a distinctive atmosphere. I would have liked the ending to have wrapped things up a little more than it did, but this was still probably one of the most gripping experiences I've had this year. I didn't murder Simon. You've got it wrong. You've got the wrong person. Grow Home is a tricky game to describe. It's a 3D platformer that's equal parts Crackdown and Starseed Pilgrim. I do love me some Crackdown, and Grow Home recaptures that same collector's compulsion of the agility orbs with its crystals. You see one, collect it, and then you spot another one on a distant rock or floating island, and you collect that one, and then you see another and another. All of them have to be reached using the game's crazy control scheme where you control both arms of the robot dude you play as independently. It takes a bit of getting used to, but when you do, it's a really fun and tactile way of traversing the environment. The crystals help you upgrade your jetpack, and who doesn't love jetpacks in games? Or you can straddle the giant plants that grow up into the sky towards your mothership. There's something really satisfying about reaching the top and looking down on the network of platforms that you've grown, like some kind of digital sculpture, and then throwing yourself all the way down to the bottom, of course, because why not? The verticality in this game is crazy! Yeah, the game's pretty short, but does Metal Gear Solid V have an adorable little robot with a jetpack that uses flowers as parachutes? No, it doesn't. So Grow Home is clearly better than Metal Gear Solid V. Oh, and it's my ninth favourite game of the year. Lost Orbit is a pretty simple game. All you really do is dodge rocks, but I still had a lot of fun with it. The first thing I'll say is the soundtrack is amazing. The second thing I'll say is that the soundtrack is amazing. Did I already say that? Because the soundtrack is amazing. Oh, and the game is pretty good too. It controls really well and you get a real sense of velocity as you zoom past asteroids and the game strikes a nice balance of arcadey time attack fun and being a well presented, surprisingly decent story experience. The voiceover narration reminded me of something like Bastion and the writing is well done, way more so than it needed to be for this kind of game. It gets a little samey towards the end but I still recommend checking out Lost Orbit, it's a bit of an overlooked gem. We live in this post Five Nights at Freddy's 4 world where I feel like the art of the jump scare is getting lost amongst all the YouTubers screaming and wetting their pants, so I'm glad that Until Dawn exists. Not that it didn't lead to a lot of YouTubers screaming and wetting their pants while playing it, but it's great to see a game that hasn't forgotten how to get jump scares right. Until Dawn really nails the tension and suspense of a classic teen slasher flick and shamelessly wears its influences on its sleeve. Also, it looks great with its use of photorealistic face capture technology, and the acting's not half bad either. I'm a big fan of the fourth wall breaking therapist sections, and I think it's in these sections that the game shows that, although it's heavily influenced by cinema, the game absolutely wants to make the most out of its interactivity. Compared to other games following the Telltale adventure game template, Until Dawn is refreshingly upfront about exactly how choices affect the story, actually showing you the cause and effect of each major decision you make. Some of it is still smoke and mirrors, and the fact that one major decision is pre-decided is kind of a bummer, but even if it doesn't hold up well to a second playthrough, I still enjoyed my first playthrough a lot from start to finish. QTEs still kinda suck though. Yes. 
I'd be the first person to admit that I'm crap at Dark Souls. I own the game on two systems, but I still haven't finished it. And honestly, I found the game to be more punishing than enjoyable, so I wasn't sure if I'd dig Bloodborne, but actually I ended up really enjoying it. A lot of the things I liked about Bloodborne are kind of the same strengths that Dark Souls has. Great combat, intense and memorable boss battles that are so goddamn satisfying to beat, the excellent fusion of multiplayer and single player, and so on. I will say that I like the slightly faster pace and zippier movement of Bloodborne, and for whatever reason I find parrying with guns more natural than parrying with shields, so I was able to get that down much easier this time around. I love the game's grotesque, Lovecraftian creature design and oppressive atmosphere as well. Bloodborne is undoubtedly simplified compared to Dark Souls, but it was a Souls-style game I was actually able to finish and I had a lot of fun doing it. Yeah, I like this game a lot. Apart from the Nightmare of Mensis. That place can burn in hell. Batman Arkham Asylum and City were two of my favourite games of the last generation, and I say this to give some context when I say that Batman Arkham Knight is my least favourite of the Rocksteady developed trilogy. Which is not to say it's bad, it wouldn't be on this list if it was. I really enjoyed Arkham Knight, but I think this game's major new addition, the Batmobile, is something of a mixed bag. On the one hand, it's a really fun way of getting around the game's world, and there's something really cool about being able to summon the Batmobile at the press of a button almost anywhere. The way it's worked into the puzzle solving is pretty neat, and I love the burnout style high speed chase sections as well. On the other hand, the tank combat sections aren't that great, not terrible maybe, but there's way too many of them and they look really one dimensional compared to the game's awesome melee combat, which is more smooth and refined than ever and gives you loads of options to work with. Also I thought that some of the Batmobile bosses were honestly pretty terrible and I'm not a fan of the Riddler races either. Aside from that though, this is still a great Arkham game with the fantastic combat and stealth the series is known for. The fear takedowns are super satisfying and there are some really cool story moments. The way they worked in one particular villain was impressive. I've been fairly harsh on the game because I loved the previous games so much and I had really high expectations for this one which weren't quite met, but this was still undoubtedly one of my favourite games of this year. With The Beginner's Guide, Davy Reedon's follow-up to The Stanley Parable, Reedon has created another game that's difficult to describe, and I can't really say why this game is on this list without spoiling it for those who haven't played it. Damn you, Davy! What I will say is that, although tonally this is very different from The Stanley Parable, The Beginner's Guide is another really intriguing metafictional trip that explores the relationship between a creator and its audience. This one feels much more personal to Reedon and blends autobiographical detail with fiction in a way that feels makes it feel disarmingly honest whilst also being a nice bit of interactive storytelling. Like I said, I can't really explain why it's on this list without spoiling things, but all I will say is that the game is still kicking around in my thoughts long, long after the brief 90 minutes I spent with it. It's a game I suspect some people will love and others will hate, but I still recommend just going into it blind and experiencing it for yourself. Coda starts making these games, and he never releases any of them. He doesn't put them onto the internet. Much like Clay Entertainment's last stealth game, Mark of the Ninja, what's made Invisible Link such a delight for me hasn't just been its tight design, but also how it feels to play. They always do a great job with nailing the presentation of their games, and this is no exception, with incredibly slick visual and sound design that really immerses you in these bite-sized stealth heist missions. It's definitely a game that warrants playing on higher difficulties once you get the hang of its systems, and the combination of randomised maps, permadeath, limited rewinds and a steadily increasing security level demands the player to continuously think on their feet. There's also a neat risk-reward dynamic where players can try and explore every room, hack every safe and leave with as much loot as possible, but with every turn security will steadily increase until the whole area is swarming with guards and security cameras. And then you're ducking and weaving out of guards' line of sight, hacking security cameras, planting bombs on doors, inching closer and closer to the escape, and when one of your agents gets, gets spotted and then the other agent jumps out from behind a computer terminal with an ambush attack as he goes to investigate, it's just so damn satisfying every single time. I'm not normally a fan of turn-based strategy games, and I'm surprised not only that I enjoyed this one so much, but that it was just as intense as any great real-time stealth game I've played. 
But hey, it's Clay Entertainment and they've made some damn fine games, so perhaps I shouldn't be surprised at all. To top it off, there's a great selection of characters and abilities to unlock that encourage different playstyles and approaches. Unlike many, maybe even most of the games I've played this year, I've been drawn back to Invisible Ink time and time again. I think it's great, and it's my third favourite game of 2015. What was that? You want a reason to play Just Cause 3? Two words, wingsuit. Just Cause 2 already had one of the most fun traversal mechanics in any open world game with the hookshot and parachute, but Just Cause 3 perfects it with the wingsuit and lets you glide gracefully through the air whenever you're airborne. In fact, now that staying in the air whilst raining down bullets and grenades is easier than ever, I'd say Just Cause 3 almost qualifies as an aerial combat game, and a damn fun one at that. If you're not sold on the wingsuit, what about the multiple retractable tethers you're given to play with this time around? They remind me of the Magnet Gun from Red Faction Armageddon, which is one of my favourite weapons of all time, and combined with the game's insane physics, they're responsible for some of the finest slapstick comedy I've experienced in a game to date. This game also has some of the most satisfying explosions ever, and I love how easy it is to create a domino effect of destruction when tearing bases apart. You can fling an explosive barrel at a fuel tank, which will then fall onto another fuel tank, which will roll towards a generator, which blows up. I mean, you get the idea. Some reviewers complained about the game getting repetitive, but I actually found the rhythm and flow of the game's progression to be very addictive, as you liberate a base, which unlocks challenges, which earns you gears to unlock crazy upgrades that make liberating bases even more fun. Most of the single player missions I've played have been pants, but I mostly ignore them as much as I can. The only real bummer about this game is the poor loading times and frame rate on the PS4. Uh, but despite that, I've been having truckloads of fun with this game. It's like popping virtual bubble wrap. Brainless, but always inherently entertaining. Ah, Undertale, a game that's managed to enrapture and enrage people in equal measure. Is Undertale the best game ever made? I don't think so, no. But it is my favourite game of the year. Why? Well, for me, no other game from this year has been so full of clever little surprises. No other game has made me laugh from start to finish. No other game has so confidently smashed through the fourth wall to such great effect. No other game has had characters that are well written enough that you actually care about them far more than you would expect by the end. No other game has given me the option to talk my way out of every single fight, or simply to kill everyone if I wanted, and has bent the tone of the story around these decisions. No other game has seamlessly blended the bullet hell RPG and puzzle genres to create something that actually felt unique. No other game has let me date a skeleton or had this many bone related puns. For me, no other game from this year has been quite as delightful as Undertale, and that is why it's my game of the year for 2015. So those were my favourite games of the year. A couple that didn't quite make the list. Soma, I quite enjoyed that game. Techno Babylon was pretty good as well. Uh, thanks for watching and I hope you have fun in 2016.